Corvus Belly were kind enough to send me a review copy of their new fantasy skirmish game, Warcrow. And I've already spent a lot of time with the game and models, and I'm ready to share with you what you get in the box, a little about how the game plays, what my thoughts are for the game, and most importantly, help you figure out, is this game for me? Warcrow is a skirmish battle game set in a world called Lindworm. Celestial bodies have aligned and magic is on the rise in the world, swinging the balance of power between the nations, creating a time of uncertainty and opportunity through warfare. There is also word of a red fog known to the orcs as the lurking evil that has been descending on lands, bringing with it horror and death. Winds from the North is the starter set for the game and provides all you need to get started playing games of Warcrow with two faction armies and terrain. The hegemony of Ember Sig is a faction that has quickly risen to dominance in Lindworm, with its advanced technology, organisational structure, expansionist policies and, most importantly, its integration of the races of men, elves and dwarves. They believe the constituent parts of the nation combine to make the nation stronger. However, they now find enemies on all sides of their borders, and with a young king at their helm, the surrounding nations see the hegemony ripe for plunder. One such nation that has been particularly aggressive in the northern borders is that of the northern tribes. The northern tribes are an alliance of orcs, expert warriors who live for war and plunder, and the Varunk tattooed tribal warriors able to transform into ferocious creatures thanks to their spirit animal and totems. Living in the frozen north, the northern tribes are now pushing south, taking land from the Mount Haven dwarves and raiding the hegemony. The orcs are incredibly mistrustful of other races, and it's rare to see them even fight alongside the Varank. But with the encroaching fog and the opportunity for war in the south, they have managed to put aside their differences. Corvus Belly are better known for their sci-fi skirmish game Infinity, and what has made their game stand out from the crowd more than the unique rule set are the beautiful miniatures they produce. Warcrow is no exception to this, and the miniatures provided all have unique sculpts and every one of them is highly detailed. The biggest surprise though, when compared to the game of Infinity, is the decision to make all Warcrow miniatures from Sirecast injection mold plastic. Corvus Belly have been working with Sciocast for a while now, using it for larger Infinity miniatures such as tags and remotes. They have learned a lot and when I compare their Sciocast with other companies that use the process, Corvus Belly's Sciocast is the best I have seen. That doesn't mean it does not come with some problems. The plastic does not always go together as well as it could, leaving gaps that need to be filled. I didn't have many problems with the hegemony models, but I did with the orcs. There were some pretty big gaps that needed to be fixed with putty before I could get on with painting them. The texture of Sciocast is also a bit weird when compared to other plastics or metals. The texture is a little rubbery, so it's easy to use nippers to cut the material, but removing mold lines with a knife or trying to file down flash is particularly difficult, as it often tears inconsistently. Luckily, there were not many defects in the pieces that I had in terms of the surface of the miniatures. There are injection points that need to be removed, but for the most part these are pretty carefully selected points that won't be that noticeable on the finished model. I was also lucky that I didn't have any bent parts other than a slightly curved end to the sorcerer's staff. However, I have heard online that if any swords are bent, it's very difficult to get Sirecast to hold a new shape. Usually for metal, you can just carefully bend it yourself. Other plastics can be reshaped using hot water. However, Sirecast is resistant to both methods and can be a bit frustrating. Sirecast does come with some advantages over other plastics and metal miniatures. First, when comparing to the Infinity Metal miniatures, it's a lot faster to super glue the pieces together. It also means that after painting, dropping the miniatures is a lot less scary. Compared to other plastics, the material is able to hold more sculpted detail, like a metal miniature does. The depth of detail cannot be as fine as metal miniatures, but that is also why Warcrow has a slightly larger scale than what Infinity has. 
I have to say, all the miniatures in this set are beautiful, and although the process of putting them together is not very beginner friendly, they look great once they're fully assembled. The set provides seven miniatures for the hegemony. One unit has four bucklermen, with one of them being the leader. Each model has a unique sculpt and they all look great. The design of the miniatures and the official colour scheme remind me of Nilfgaard from the Witcher series, and that to me is really great. I don't often get to paint this design style of miniatures, and with such interesting poses and high detail, I'm excited to paint them up. There are then three individual characters. The first is the War Doctor, who looks great with her Plague Doctor mask. The design is stylish and makes this miniature probably my favourite for the hegemony. Then we have the elf Frostfire Herald, a sorcerer that has great detail in the sculpt and is doing his best Infinity Hacker impression, summoning a magical book with his pointer and middle finger. Could we be seeing this guy making an appearance in Bakunin? Probably not. But he could make a good proxy for Oberon in Aristea. Huh. Finally, we have Drago, the leader of this warband. He has some really nice details across the sculpt. There is nothing that special about his pose, but it does read as a proud commander. The arm with the gun is sculpted into the cape, which means that there is no danger of it being fragile, but it does half disappear, looking a little odd, but I imagine once painted up, it will look fine. The overall design of the Hegemony miniatures gives a consolidated army design that has some very nice details. All the sculpts are highly detailed and it's going to be fun to slap some paint on them. The Northern Tribes get an equivalent set of seven miniatures. Straight away, the biggest difference we can see is the sheer size of the Orcs compared to the Hegemony models, making them look far more intimidating and menacing, as they should. The army has a unit of four orc hunters, and what I love about the miniatures is the dynamic and aggressive poses they each have. The sculpts really reflect the eagerness of these warriors wanting to get into the thick of combat. Their first support character is the Wise Mane, an old orc leader who has been dethroned and now helps train the young using his experience and knowledge of warfare. The miniature has some real bulk and carries a lot of details. He is a much more reserved menace to his pose than the Orc Hunters, and that club looks terrifying. The Orcs also get a magic user in the form of the Evoker, a much lankier character than the other Orcs. She obviously gets her strength from her ability to conjure magic. She has a very shamanistic design and is definitely trying to look as cool as possible with perhaps the largest tactical rock in the range. Finally, we have the leader of the Orc Warband, Albork. This guy is beefy. When an Orc becomes a leader of a tribe, their hair turns orange and they grow in size to be immense Orcs. And Albork is damn big. Really ferocious looking model and will be a joy to paint. Although the Orcs had the most problems with their construction, they definitely have a very aggressive design that looks great. And with the larger size of the miniatures, the details look crisp, and I'm going to have a whale of a time painting these guys. We've already had a look at the miniatures, but what else is in the box? First we have the play area and terrain. The set comes with a fold-out poster for the gameplay mat that is 2 foot by 2 foot. The resolution of the play mat and the details are very nice, but the folds and shine of the glossy surface are not ideal. If you have a cloth, PVC or neoprene battle mat, I would use that over this. If you don't though, the poster mat will do. Bear in mind that the full game will use a 3 foot by 3 foot game area, so it may be worth investing in one if you are looking to expand from this set in the future. The terrain is made from thick card stock and is very sturdy. It all goes together easily and looks really good. They are also easy to take apart and rebuild in case you are traveling with the game although continued use will likely see them get scuffed and damaged. You get a farmhouse, shed, two walls and four fences, and this is more than enough terrain for the small play area that this set uses. This terrain would also be enough for a full 3 foot by 3 foot game, as the game does not require dense terrain the way Infinity does. There are also additional flat terrain tiles to add more to the field, but these will obviously look better if replaced with your own fully 3D terrain if you have it. It's still a welcome addition for those that don't have their own fantasy terrain though. War 
Warcrow uses its own proprietary dice using similar symbols to other Corvus Belli games, such as Aristea and Infinity Defiance. However, where the previous games used D6s with offensive and defensive symbols across all colors of dice, Warcrow uses D8 and splits the dice into offensive and defensive dice. Offensive dice, red, orange, and yellow, carry successes, while defensive dice, green, blue, and black, carry shields. Both also have this special symbol and also hollow variants of each of the symbols. This makes it very easy to understand what results you'll be expecting to get from the color of the die. The one issue that might stem from this colored die system is whether it affects colorblind players. Without something to signify the dice you are rolling beyond the color, it could make for some issues there. There are also a lot of counters and tokens. They all look very fluffy and reflect the fantasy style of the game, but at first glance it's very difficult to understand each symbol's meaning and use. I thought this was going to be a big issue as I expected to keep referencing the rulebook to check what token was used for what, but I have to say after one game most of the tokens became second nature and referencing wasn't needed. These are also all of the counters you will need for the game, whatever the size and whatever the faction. As far as I can tell at the moment, you get all the counters you need to cover all states and actions in the full rulebook. And unless specific units will require counters for unique abilities, you have everything here and it doesn't take long to internalize their use. We get a number of tools in the set used for tracking information in the game and for measuring ranges. The turn counter is like a clock that tracks the lengths of rounds, event timings and timed effects. It works very well at doing a lot of the bookkeeping in a very visual and easy way for all players to understand what is coming and how many turns are left in a round. Measurements are made in Warcrow's unique scale of measurement called a stride. The short template measures lengths between 2 and 5 strides, while the long template measures as far as 20. The game does not use measuring tape and these two templates give you everything you need for moving units and checking ranges. Finally, there is this funky little initiative token which is held by whichever player has initiative for the round. This can then change hands depending on conditions at the end of a round. For the miniatures in the set, there are unit cards that go with them to give you all the information you need in front of you as you play and keep track of wounds and other effects. The format is easy to read once you have played the game, making it easy to find the information you need. The font is a little small and the size of the cards is different to anything that Corvus Belli have released previously as far as I know. My spare sleeves that I got for Infinity Defiance and Tag Raid are about a centimeter too big on the length and width of the cards. I would have liked the cards to be the same size as those previous games as it would have also made the font a touch bigger and fitted all the sleeves I have. I can still use the sleeves as the card is smaller so it's only a small complaint. Finally, there is the introductory booklet. It's full of colorful pages with beautiful art and photos of the painted miniatures. The first page gives a brief overview of the lore of Warcrow and is followed by some more lore describing the two factions in the set. The majority of the booklet then covers the rules through some step-by-step -step examples that you can play out. At the back of the book is then a narrative campaign that you can play with a friend that covers three missions that are connected to one another. The lore is well written and gives you just enough to get a sense of why these two sides are fighting and their place in the world. The rules for the most part are also very easy to follow with lots of examples of how to play out the game. The diagrams help with understanding the concepts written out in the text. I sometimes found it hard to find specific terms or information regarding the rules as there is no index for the booklet. Another important point is that this booklet does not contain the full rules to play the game. There are some key things missing, such as telling the player what the additional dice and symbols are on the combat panel of the character cards, how Albork's dispel ability works, and the ability of spellcasters to block spells. Some of these are errors in the booklet, while others are not listed to keep the rule set simple for new players. Either way, the full rules are important to have and thankfully Corvus Belli provides them free online in a PDF document where it's easy to search for keywords and it has an index. 
I'm not going to spoil the narrative campaign for you, but in the games I played with friends, it was a lot of fun and very narratively driven. It also adds complexity as you get comfortable with the concepts and mechanics of the game. The only issue I had with it were some of the references to events. In the campaign there are sometimes certain actions that trigger the next event, but some of the references link you to the wrong text. It's easy to spot, but a little frustrating at first when it doesn't make sense, and one monster unit card in the English version is in Spanish. Luckily, the unit card is listed elsewhere in the booklet in English, uh, but that was a mistake that should have been caught before going to print. Because there are few miniatures, there is a danger in the last mission in particular, where if the key units that progress the events die too early, then all the following events are unable to trigger, making it just a land grab mission. It's great if the event is triggered, but a little underwhelming if it isn't. Overall, I'm really pleased with the book and its presentation. The few mistakes that are there don't prevent you from being able to play the game and will only act as brief speed bumps for the first time you play. I won't be going deep into the rules in this video, but I hope to in future videos. Mostly, I want to share with you how the game feels to play and the experience I have had with it so far. As we played through some scenarios, it felt like we were making a story. With the objectives working toward a narrative, it gave the combat much more importance than just my guy bashes your guy. The way each unit plays is also very flavorful. Even down to the simple line troops, the hegemony bucklermen are able to take a beating and hold down objectives, whereas the orc hunters pile on damage and can choose to ignore their shields in favour of doing more damage to the attacker. Not to mention that each of the individual characters have their own unique role to fill. All the units felt like they had their place on the battlefield and they were each fulfilling their own unique role. One area that makes this game unique in comparison to others is how it deals with pushing the enemy in combat. There is a tug of war mechanic that takes place as units win or lose combats. It does not matter how many units are on an objective, it's whoever has the highest conquest within range. My experience of other games is either one side captures the objective or it is contested because both have a unit in range. In Warcrow, how you contest objectives adds a simple but much more tactically deep mechanic that plays into the two sides' strengths and weaknesses. Along with the stress mechanic that allows you to push a unit beyond its regular limits with the danger of breaking their morale, these mechanics work very well with one another and make a very natural flow to the combat. Currently, this set will only give you about 100 points of an army where full matches have 250. So the depth of gameplay in this particular set is going to be limited, with a few units actually available to you. But it works very well at introducing new players to the game. Currently, I can only speculate what bigger games will be like from the experience of playing these smaller games, but I think your choices are going to matter a whole lot more as you will have larger armies and will probably only be able to activate half of them every round, making who you choose to activate a big decision. This brings me to another unique rule I haven't seen in games before. Because there are limited activations in a round, then some units are going to be left unable to do anything. Well, there is a mechanic called No Man Left Behind that gives all units that did not activate in a round the opportunity to use one move action if the player likes. This helps the units bringing up the back to cover some ground and still be relevant choices for activation in subsequent rounds. What a great mechanic. One last mechanic of the game I want to talk about is that some characters can be attached to certain units, such as line troopers. When they do so, their unit card is attached to the bottom of the unit card they are joining and it gives details of how they buff the unit and provide it with new abilities. This gives many units dual roles as either unique characters on the field or give another unit some unique specialization. The fact that there will be a number of units that you can mix and match these characters into gives you a whole lot more choice in the structure of your army. I'm really excited for how Warcrow is going to play with full size armies and I cannot wait for more miniatures to come out so I can give them a go.
Speaking of more miniatures, if you are looking to expand these two armies, then soon after the release of Warcrow, we're going to see the Beyond Winds from the North set that provides three miniatures for each of the armies. This will add two more units to the base armies here, giving you a chance to play some bigger games. It still won't be 250 points big, but it's getting closer. You may also be interested in getting the hard copy of the rulebook that has a lot more detail about the world of Warcrow and the factions within it. Otherwise, we just have to wait and see what comes, but Corvus Belli has promised a continuous release of models over the next few months, so I'm waiting with bated breath, looking forward for what is going to emerge from the fog. Okay, so it may be no surprise to you that I really enjoy this game, and you might be showing some interest as well at this point. The big question is then, the price. It is 130 euros retail, and that's going to be hard to justify for some. The miniatures are beautiful, and this is where most of that expense is going. If you are interested in both these armies, then this set is a no-brainer. If you only want one army, then splitting with a friend could be a good idea, but there are some components such as the rules, counters, dice, and terrain that cannot be split easily. If these armies are not for you, I suggest waiting and seeing what comes to see if the other factions will be a better starting point for you. Corvus Belli are now close to fulfilling the Kickstarter for the Dungeon Crawler version of the game Warcrow Adventures. This will be released at retail as well and the miniatures will be able to be used in the war game. This particular set may be of interest if you are into the science as many come in the game. The game is solid and I hope it does well. There are some blemishes in terms of the Sire cast, rulebook errors and cost, but for me these do not diminish what is at its core a solid rule set in a game that has character and most importantly is fun to play. Looking forward to seeing more. Thanks for watching, please leave a like, comment and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. It helps no end and I appreciate all your support. We will be back with a look at the miniatures from the set with some tutorials on painting techniques and of course more information about Warcrow and its future.